My name is Jonah Jonathan, and welcome once again to the Jazz Musician's Voice. Today, I've got an interview with a great friend of mine, Abel Vadia, jazz guitarist who uh, went to quite a few great schools, uh, the Berkeley School of Music and NYU for graduate school. We've played many gigs together, and uh, Abe has played all over the world. Um, he's real successful in his craft. He's fun to play with, and he's also an entrepreneur. Uh, he opened up his own music business where he's teaching lessons and he's also uh, sold straps um, he sold straps uh, he invented the uh, master strap which uh, holds picks for guitarists and um, he's got other ventures that he's gone into and we have a great uh, discussion about his life and the music so thanks for watching this interview please subscribe and stay tuned we've got a lot more future interviews coming Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, today I'm speaking with a good friend of mine, Abe Ovadia, a world-class guitarist, jazz guitarist, one of the younger guys. Um, you know, I've known Abe for well over probably like 12, 13 years now. When I first came to New York, uh, we met at the jam sessions and uh, we played a lot of gigs together. And uh, Abe, you're also like an entrepreneur, like a businessman, you open a music school, You've uh, invented a, a strap, um, you've recorded, and uh, went to some great schools. So um, thanks for being part of this series, Abe. Of course, my pleasure. Great to reconnect. Yeah, so uh, let's talk about your early background, your roots uh, in music, how you got started, where you're from, and how you got serious on guitar. Sure. Uh, born and raised in Marlboro, New Jersey, right in the center of New Jersey, big commuter town, so short distance away from New York City. So everyone who lives here pretty much works in Manhattan, big percentage. Um, music was always a part of my life uh, as um, I always uh, loved all types of music. You know, my father introduced me to Israeli music when I was a kid. I always liked dance parties, that sort of thing. But as far as the guitar goes, um, I was with my father one day, spending an afternoon together uh, when I was nine, and uh, we were on our way to Toys R Us, and we drove past the music store that had a guitar in their logo in the front of the store, and I told him I'd really like to have my own guitar, and he said to me, well, you know, if I get you a guitar, we're not going to Toys R Us, but there's going to be no more Toys R Us. So you have to decide right now. So I went with the guitar and, uh, you know, I loved it from the beginning. Um, you know, like most kids, I wasn't practicing every day. It was just sort of a hobby. But then when I was 13, I joined uh, the middle school jazz band. That was when I really first started to, you know, the, the practice became a daily ritual. Um, you know, my technique was improving. And uh, so that, and I really, you know, got the exposure to being around other musicians. And then in high school, um, I was very involved in the music program. I joined every single um, band that they had. There was the, the marching band, the concert band, the jazz band, the orchestra. So I just wanted to immerse myself um, in as much music as possible because that, it was at that point where I decided that I wanted to make a career out of it. Um, and that's when, you know, things start to get uh, pretty intense where I'm staying home instead of going out with my friends, I'm staying home on Saturday night to, to really practice. Cause I know I want to, you know, audition for music school and this is what I'm going to do. So, you know, it was high school where things, things got serious. Great. Really? I mean, um, yeah, I mean, uh, they certainly got serious because you, you decided to attend, uh, you know, you went to Berkeley, right, um, for your undergrad. Um, so talk about, like, making the decision to do music full time, like professionally, you know? Sure. Well, the, I knew, uh, in retrospect, Berkeley was one of the best things I ever decided to do, but also... Um, I don't want to say the worst things, but it was it was a really you know hard time um, because I knew I wanted to expose myself and be around musicians. I said if I'm going to thrive, um, I really need to go to a place where I'm going to you know just be around musicians all the time. And you know Berkeley is a very competitive school. Um, 
and uh, you know, you, there's a thousand guitarists, and uh, it was at Berkeley. When I went into Berkeley, I was playing classical guitar and fusion guitar, um, rock guitar too. And uh, when I was in my first week of Berkeley, there were people I was meeting who were playing fusion music, just going into B Berkeley, just starting at age 18. They were playing the way I had hoped to play when I leave. So it, I was, I was pretty, uh, pretty intimidated. Um, and it was just right there on, on a moment decision. I'm just like, you know, you know, jazz doesn't seem too, you know, too hard. It seems like, you know, it's uh, maybe I could just, you know, study jazz and I'll thrive at that. I'll, maybe it'll be easy. Little did I know that I'm going to be getting into the hardest genre of music, jazz improvisation. You know, we all know about it. And, uh, and but then at the same time, I really fell in love with the music. So it was it was a decision made not necessarily for the right reasons, but ended up, you know, being, you know, being uh, my career path to be to be a jazz guitarist and has led me to everything I've, you know, done in my music career to everything I'm doing presently. Uh, Berkeley is a very hard school. Um, I really, you know, I think I was kind of intimidated by there were so many students and you know everyone there's there's people who do songwriting there's people who do country music there's people who do film scoring and then you have this me I'm just you know some kid from New Jersey who was you know the guitarist in the town and you know I'm just was was kind of know where do I go and then but then things got even more intense there so that's when the the practicing you know got to a whole other level because I knew I'm like, I'm not, I don't just have to become a better guitarist. I have to learn about jazz. So that left very little room for, for socializing. You know, the, I pretty much, you know, I almost, I didn't leave my apartment basically for, for four years, you know, except to go to class, to practice, you know, um, and to, to, to play the jam sessions I did. So it was, um, it was a really, you know, it, it was that that was the woodshed for me you know yeah i mean uh to re reach a certain level of expertise on the instrument you've certainly got to do that and put that time in um you know i, I would suppose uh, more in back in history like uh that was like you know you put your time in you got with major recording artists you make a lot of money nowadays it's like judging like how much time do you really put in on something? Because um, there's, there's not necessarily the return in jazz, but uh, Berkeley uh, had like so many different uh, genres of music and so, so many people came out of that, like such as like, uh, you talk about like Dream Theater, for example, all that, that metal band were all like jazz majors, but went into metal, you know? Um, so, uh, you finished up Berkeley and like, uh, so who, who were some of the, the guitarists you studied with at Berkeley? Uh, I studied with, uh, my primary teacher was a man named John Thomas. He was, um, the strictest teacher I've ever encountered in my life. Um, he was known to being, you know, uh, he, he's, he's very hard. Um, he really pushed me to, to another level. Um, he never complimented you. Um, he, you know, told you, you know, you don't sound good. Uh, you need to, you need to work. And, you know, finally at my senior recital, he, you know, um, I think I got my first compliment. He, he came when, when I, you know, in, in four years, he was very influential on me. Um, I also studied with uh, a jazz guitarist named Garrison Fuel, who's um, no longer with us. Um, another jazz guitarist by the name of Tim Miller. Um, he's a great, great um, technical uh, virtuoso um, out of the school of, let's say, Alan Holdsworth. So I had some really great guitar teachers at Berkeley, um, but John was the one who really pushed me to that to that level. I, I, you know, just n not just to gain his approval, but because his language was so intense. He's played with Joe Henderson. He played with Dizzy Gillespie. Um, you know, he played with Charles Zierland. He, you know, he had played with the masters. 
So his standards were so high. And he want, and, and a lot of his students actually went, uh, went on to, to be quite prolific guitar players like Lage Lund, um, Raleigh McKick, I believe his name is, uh, uh, Avi Rothbard. So, you know, a lot, of, a lot of New York guys did, you know, did study with him at Berkeley as well. So um, he, he was the one who really, he brought the best, uh, the best out of you, even though it wasn't, you know, you know, yeah, man, sounds great. It was the exact opposite of that, just, just being honest. And, you know, you would spend one semester just learning how to play like one thing, you know, like let's say it was 32 bars of some sort of chordal structure and, and it, you just have to, it, it was very intense, you know, sort of, you know, the, the less is more approach. Well, uh, you know, I remember uh, meeting you in New York, um, you know, I think you had already graduated NYU by then, um, graduate school. And you could talk a little bit about NYU, but, um, you know, I remember you talking to me about some of the guitars you're interested in. Uh, you were telling me about Pat Martino. And um, so talk about like coming to New York, uh, going to NYU and some of the more of the guys you were checking out as a, as a guitarist and your influences. Sure. Well, I, I knew that New York was the jazz capital of the world, you know. I started making trips to New York when I was living in Boston, where, where we had met. I, I, you know, people were telling us, "Oh, you got to go down to this place, Fat Cat. You got to go down to this place, Smalls." And you know, I remember I, I packed up my guitar, would take the bus down from 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 uh, Boston. Sometimes go back to Boston at like four o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. you know, where, where 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 we had met, and I got to see, you know, I I had never seen anything like this. I remember when we had met you were playing you were playing on a blues you were accompanying probably a half hour worth of soloists yeah yeah those <laughs> things go on for a long time <laughs> yeah i had never seen anything like this before in my life you know and and but you know and i remember you know you know you you, you know when i you know you kind of when you go to hear music you 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 we listen with our eyes sometimes so I remember, I remember when, I, when I was watching you play and, uh, and then I, you know, I saw the intensity, but I, and I, I, I heard the language and I said, okay, I was, I, I was like, I, I got to play with this bass player, you know? <laughs> uh, and, but, but, you know, then you end up developing relationships with people. We didn't play together that night, but then when I remember, okay, when I, when I have some, when I start getting some gigs, I, I want to call this guy Jonah. Because I think we, yeah. you know, we have a lot of the same influences and stuff, and ended up doing some, yeah. you know, like some really great gigs together. So, you know, grad school is part of it, but it's just these types of connections that you just make, you know, purely just by, you know, and, and I remember, like, I remember that first time, like, I heard like so many people play, like, you know, like yourself, and I, I remember I that night, that first night, I remember I heard Stacy Dillard play, and I heard you know, uh, Scott Tixier play violin, you know? So it, w it was like, you know, pretty much like I got to get a peek of New York, like r right then and there, what it was going to be like. So that's when yeah. that kind of like, you know, was the, um, that got the, from the idea in my head, okay, I'm going go to go to, to grad school in New York. And that's when I went to NYU. But, uh, and, and that was, you know, that was, that was the perfect fit because I got to, you know, you know, be studious, but at the same time, go hear a lot of music, go play jam sessions, that sort of thing. So it was, it was the right decision at the right time. So that's, that's great. That's you know, work. yeah, you know, at the time that we met, um, it was still before the iPhone, you know, the iPhone was just coming out. Well, I found and, you on um, MySpace, I remember. Yeah, yeah business cards. Business cards were still the way to go at that time where people would give business cards and give people a call. Now everything is Facebook. It's, if anything, it's, it's completely changed, you know. But even, uh, even I would talk with uh, Mulgrew and he's like, I never, I never needed a business card in my life and I never had a website. And I, I you know, and Mulgrew is one of the most recorded pianists. It's, it's like, a, it's a shift in this music now it was much more of like an oral thing where people everything is word of mouth like who who's a good player and stuff 
to now where everything is about like uh, polished website, EP, EPK, like all that type of stuff. But I remember we're kind of at the tail end of end of that era, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, we got to touch on MySpace, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. This is not, I don't think it really, you know, people aren't finding people on MySpace these days, you know? Yeah, to, but that to, was a thing for a while before Facebook, yeah. It was a big thing, MySpace. <laughs> you can find someone on Facebook like instantly, like a, a famous jazz musician, you could call them like, oh, I got this gig, you know, and, uh, you know, right on, the, it's, a, it, it's a totally different time. And now with this pandemic, you know, who knows what's gonna be after this. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, so let's talk a little bit about like your, uh, your work ethic with uh, getting gigs because um, you play quite a lot of gigs and tours and stuff and you you put your own effort into getting these gigs like playing at places that uh, like some some musicians they just want to be sidemen uh, in, in many instances I'm on that way I don't want to like I don't like to go out and promote too much to a club but uh, I certainly know there are some people who are really good at doing that and getting a bunch of gigs so talk about like you know, I know you were working with like New New Brunswick Jazz Project. We played some gigs with like drummer Chris Brown, and uh, you know, um, so talk about like what it is like for the for the viewers who are wanting to like do something like what you're doing. Talk well, about your process of getting gigs. You know, well, that well, when I first the, the thing is with me, jam sessions were you know a lot of people say you know, you want to get gigs in New York, go to, go to do jam sessions. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm sure a lot of people have had negative experiences like myself, you know, whether it's, you know, like, you know, vibing or whatever it is, or you know, that, 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 that term. But um, I knew that like, I was going to have to take a different approach because these experiences, I, you know, I would go to jam sessions and people would like be handing me sheet music. I'm like, this is a jam session. Like, if you want to call me for a gig and play your music, it's going to cost money. You know what I mean? And then people are arguing about the tunes they're going to play and stuff. And people are yelling at each other. And I'm like, I, I'm like, you know, I'm, I, I knew I was going to have to take a different approach. So what I did was I, I you know, I started playing gigs in New York, you know, I, at certain venues, like uh, with my own band, on a, you know, sometimes two, three days a week, there were some venues at, you know, that are like um, no longer in existence, but you know, my first, my first residency was at a place called, you know, Cafe Vivaldi uh, right on Jones Street. So I played there every Sunday, you know, I would go to play at this other place on the Lower East Side called Pianos, you know, sometimes two, three times a week, they would call me. And that's where I kind of developed my, cause I, I, I know the way I want to present music you know, I'm not necessarily someone, you know, I would consider myself a sideman. I mean, I'd be happy to do if the music was right. But I, you know, if you have such a, if you have a vision of what you want to do, you have to put yourself in the situation. For me to play the tunes I want to play, you know, I, I, you know, it wasn't going to be at, at jam sessions. It was going to be putting myself where I can play for people, where I can play with the musicians I want to play with. Because sometimes you would go to a jam session and you know it's not that the the other musicians you know are are you know are bad but they're just hearing they're just hearing harmony and rhythm the completely opposite way you are so that's how i went about starting it so it just went on and i did you know you know a lot of these things and gradually and gradually what went from being not you know those those first venues led up to you know it was like just this the like little little increments you were making and, you know, uh, it started to leading to better venues. It started to leading to better play, uh, paying uh, concerts and stuff. And that just kind of been, that was the trajectory I went up. I just knew I was gonna have to do things a little bit differently. And, and then when you're doing that, you know, you know, you get to record, you get to, um, you, know, get, you know, get videos of yourself. And, you know, that's just, that's just the thing. That's how you, you know, learn about how you want to play this music. It's just, uh, you know, that, that, that was my approach. It's, it might be a little bit different, but it, it's, it certainly worked for me. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about this. Like you, uh, 
you came up with this idea for the master strap. I don't know if you had them near you, but like you invented a, a, a pocket for picks for guitars and then created this whole line of that. So talk about how that came about. And I know you got some help from your, your father and your family with that, you know? Sure. Well, uh, my father's been in manufacturing. Um, so, you know, he manufactures dog products. So dog leashes are actually a very similar manufacturing process to guitar straps. The materials are the same. Um, you know, we, we, he introduced me to the contracts, the contractors I would be using. But that really came about because, you know, you know, there were certain, like, I remember an interview you did with, with, with Stacy Dillard, you know, and he said, I remember this very, because, you know, he said, you can pursue the career or you can pursue the art, you know? And just, ha you know, working in so many bands, like cover bands and cruise ships, um, you know, I knew I, knew I was done. Like I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. I'm, I'm completely miserable. You know, like usually before you go out and play with a band, you want to be excited. But I'm like, I remember I was like on the road with this cover band, and I'm like, I'm more. I've never been so unhappy in my life playing music. So that's when I decided just going to be jazz. But then there's going to have to be something else. You know, because jazz is not going to pay the bills right away. And I don't want to play other types of music like in the same capacity anymore. So, you know, um, that's where the idea for, you know, inventing a strap company, I, th I thought there was a niche because straps were either very cheaply made or very expensive. So I wanted to find, you know, you know, make a product that was accessible for every, everyone. So that led to, to master strap master strap also led to, um, another, um, you know the the sister the spirit straps brand which was making uh collegiate guitar straps because that was also something you know because some people are so into their sports teams that if they, you know they go to a certain school they love their sports they play music but they don't have the strap to show it off so that led to making things you know guitar straps was the first and it led to saxophone straps to ukulele straps, you know, and then it just kept almost in the same way, like where I'm starting, like I, when I started master strap, there were 15 types of guitar straps. And then it just like, you just have to slowly like just go up this, um, you know, up this uh, path. And then, you know, you, you make more products just in the same way you, you, you do better concerts. So that's the, that's always the work ethic been, but it's, it takes, it takes, it takes time and it takes patience and it's not for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it, it's certainly paying off to you. I know exactly what you mean about about this music. Um, it's it's a challenge to do strictly jazz for, in in a business sense. You just gotta have other things you're doing and other things you're interested in to continue to do money because this music jazz is in most cases is mostly about the art, you know. Even like, uh, I remember like Spike Wilner would say this all the time. It's, it's about the art and like Smalls is like a temple. You come into the temple and you play your music and it's a spiritual thing. Um, when you start getting into the business aspect of things, it can be very tricky, especially with promoters and all that stuff. It can just get very negative. So uh, there's certainly a lot more to life than just music and there's, there's so many other things to do so talk about now like uh, we talk about like if you feel like going into this like personally you went through some health issues you went through th some things but at the same time you opened up uh, a music lessons uh, place in Monmouth New Jersey so talk about like some of your other projects and your other uh processes to stay busy through these times you know yeah i just i you know uh and I, I totally understand what you're saying about like you know that this is a spiritual music too because it is like you know you're gonna play jazz whether there are no jazz clubs if there are like if they say oh jazz cannot be performed publicly not that ever would happen you're still gonna do it just because it just gives you something that you can't get from any other music you know, 
not just to being in not just the improvisation aspect and being in the moment but the the the, the rhythm of jazz the swing you know yeah, yeah. at 110 beats per minute like quarter note walking bass line it's something you know that it's just indescribable the feeling you get from it you know so um and and then that you know that's the thing uh, you know as far as the music school goes music education has always been you know if you're a musician odds are you're going to teach in uh, in some capacity whether that's all you do during the day or whether you just have a couple students you know i always felt like i have a responsibility to you know if this is what i believe in jazz and the guitar i have a, you know i'm going to pay it forward and I'd always been teaching and stuff, but then, you know, I had started to go around the country and give some, you know, assemblies on, on jazz and stuff. And I, and I, and I kind of realized like music education is, you know, even more important to me than I had realized. But originally, uh, the reason I got the master's degree at NYU was because I wanted to be a professor. Um, I had been getting offered professorships over the years um, from various schools. I won't mention their names, but they were very misleading because they would tell you like, oh, I'm gonna hire you to, to teach at this campus, but then they want me to travel two and a half hours away to teach a class, I'm gonna lose money. And then that happened again. It happened with another school. And I'm like, yes, I finally got the professorship I've always been waiting for, you know, and then, a week before the semester, what was supposed to be 20 students ended up being two or three. I would have lost money again. I'm like, maybe when I was younger, I could have done this on my own. But, uh, you know, I, I said, no, I'm, I'm not doing it. You know, enough's enough. If you want something done, you know, you have to do it for yourself. And that's why I opened up the, the you know, the music school. And it's, and it's that whole mindset. If you want something done, you're going to go do it. You know, you're going to just put blinders on. You're going to face a tremendous amount of negativity. Uh, but um, if it's something you truly want to do, you know, you're going to put in put put in the hours and do it. And it's just that um, same thing with, you know, playing. You know, playing music. Like, you know, you're you're gonna you're gonna find your way to to do it if you truly want to do it. Like, I can't tell you even or even with Master Strap, I would drive like you know, hours with straps in my car, like in a suitcase to people. And they wouldn't even give you like five minutes of their time to show you. You'd set up a meeting with them and then they would be like, oh, I don't remember setting up the meeting. You know, it's just gonna be, you know, but, but if you persevere, you know, you're going to, you're gonna do it. You just have to, you know, you just have to have a thick skin and you have to put blinders on. So the music school has now been open for about, you know, um, about a year or so. And it's, it's a, I really wanted to create like an atmosphere that was, you know, a positive place to learn music, you know, where you can get, you know, um, what's it called? Everyone who teaches here has a degree in music, has put in their, put in their time. You know, our teachers teach multiple instruments so they can, you know, for instance, play like one of a student takes drum lessons, their teacher can also play piano with them so they get the ensemble experience. I never had that taking lessons as a child, but you realize playing with other people is so important, you know, so to give that to the children is something that I think is val valuable and, you know, maybe not other music schools think about. So, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the the career has been, you know, it's, it's, I just knew I'm like, I'm not going, you know, I don't want to just be, I want to just play jazz, but in order to do it, you're going to have to, to do other things. I remember when I had met, uh, you know, one time Dave Liebman, you know, um, outside of a, a concert I was doing, he just happened to be there, not, not necessarily to see me, but, you know, I, I went up to him and I was talking to him about the things I was doing. And he, you know, he really gave me some words of encouragement, you know, you know, if you're going to be a musician, you have to have something else going on. Um, it may not necessarily be the case for like uh, musicians like, um, you know, Roy Haynes, you know, and, and Ron Carter, you know, the, the, the true masters of the music and stuff. But um, at least if you're starting to make a career as a musician, you know, you, you know, 
or and if you want to really play jazz, you know, you have to think about some other certain things. But that just depends on what your standard of living is, too. You know, there's musicians who just don't they they, they don't mind you know their living conditions. But uh, you know, as someone who you know wants to you know you know ha have some sort of financial stability and comfort, I think it's you know it's 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 good that I started you know Master Strap. That was the first thing, and you know and. Who, know, who knows what's going to happen uh, in the future, but uh, but it's good because I also think you become a more well-rounded person too, as well. You know. Yeah, there's certainly other stuff to do. Like um, the more I might go into it, I find there's like a lot in jazz that I love. There's a lot of stuff in jazz, but there's so many other genres of music. Uh, there's like so much stuff to to get into. I mean, I love, uh, you know, disco. I love disco. Some of those musicians, uh, you know, like Nile Rodgers, that group, um, you know, he's a, he was a jazz musician first, you know. Some of his compositions, you know, Daft Punk, like some of the top hits are are somebody like that. So, and then you get into like R&B and soul. There's classical. There's all, there's all sorts of music out there. There's other other things to life, and I think more the more interviews I do, the more I find like most of the the successful jazz musicians have other hobbies, other things they're into. Uh, yeah, jazz and classical are the teachers of learning to play other. A jazz musician could yeah. play rock and roll, but a rock and roll musician may not necessarily be able to play jazz. You know. Yeah, you've got to have that harmonic foundation, but like sure. even like um, speaking with uh, with Ron about Miles Miles Davis, they would play golf, they would talk about boxing, they would uh, you know they would talk about the stock market, they would do other things. Ron Ron uh, modeled suits, you know, in fashion leader leaders in fashion, so. I think there's uh, there's plenty of other things than just like strictly straight ahead in the music. Yeah, and it's it's kind of there's this one thing like if I'm playing a jazz gig and I'm on a break with the other jazz musicians and they're just talking about jazz like on the break, you know, like odds are like we're not going to end up working together for a long time, you know. I'm not maybe if there's something specifically about the music that we just played, but if they just want to talk about jazz on the break, it's like, you know, it's I don't think we're on the same the same mindset. You know, this it's yeah. it's it's really, it's really hard to you know the process itself is so hard to you know to, to discuss them sometimes and everything, but you know, just because you're a jazz musician, you know, you know. You have uh, you do developed a work ethic to learn how to play it, then you can learn how to do so many other things. Like learn, being a jazz musician totally helped me learn how to you know um, you know do martial arts. And vice versa, martial arts helped me about martial arts taught me how to play jazz better. Because when you're in martial arts, when you're doing certain forms, there's no there's no thought like when you're playing a jazz like if i'm at a jazz concert and a famous jazz musician walks in the thought is that like like oh this person's right here now your your your, your thinking process is totally interrupted you know yeah, yeah. You martial arts or do something like play golf when you're really you know in the in the zen you know the, the moment where that's the only thing you're thinking about so and i i mean i've always had a hard time with getting in you know thinking too much when I'm playing sometimes, and especially if there's like a famous person there, then it's just like, you know, I mean, it's exciting, yeah. but it's, it may not necessarily be the best thing for the music. Well, uh, I don't know if you got your guitar there before we finish up, but uh, if you want to play something for us and talk about what guitar you play and your setup and um, kind of your sound before we finish. Yeah, I don't have my, my uh, my amplify here, but I could show you one of the guitars I have. Okay. So this is a show you, this is a, a guitar company called Music Vox Guitars. Um, you talk about being in the the right place at the right time. The, this comp when I was at NAM, 
with master strap in 2013, my booth with the straps was set up right next to, to their booth. And I, end, I end, you know, when, I, when, when I'm in the businessman mindset, I'm not, when I'm at NAMM, I don't want to play guitar like at all. Because all I hear are other people playing guitar all day. It's just like, get me out of here. You hear people playing Smoke on the Water like a thousand times. It doesn't stop, you know. But yeah, I went yeah. to the booth because I thought the guitars looked really, they were quite intriguing. And um, just started noodling around. The guy asked, do you want to try a guitar? And I said, sure, you know. And from there, you know, I started working with them. And um, they ended up, before I started, you know, working with them, they were, you know, um, they were making a lot of solid body guitars, but now they're making, you know, semi-hollow body guitars, like for a jazz musician that they would play. Um, they've been a true, you know, a true, you know, supporter of, uh, of what I'm doing. Um, and uh, believe it or not, their guitars were actually featured in the Austin Powers movie. They're, they, it's great because they really helped me get the sound I'm, I'm looking for how to how to play maybe I'm not like you know play most jazz guitarists they play like a big hollow body guitars I don't really play those anymore I, I feel like I I'm playing something that fits my my uh my personality so again if you, you know if you just go back to you know putting in that that good energy into the world you know and preparation you know there are great things that can happen at the right place, the right time, like going to NAM, even though it wasn't necessarily profitable for master strap because no one knew who we were, you know, ended up being one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me in my life to meet, to meet the, the owner of this guitar company. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, just one of those things that, uh, you know, I, I'm very thankful for. Yeah. You know, um, something I normally don't speak publicly about but like when you talk about certain companies and i will not mention their names but music business companies selling instruments and stuff um it's all about like the on a personal level taking care of that person as a customer and not not screwing over the musicians because there's certain companies out there that are out there to make money especially when musicians are in hard times such as coronavirus and such. And then you end up seeing them, yep, they're going for bankruptcy because it's all about the customer, you know? It's about yeah. the customer, it's not about, it's not about how much money you can make. It's about making that person feel good. Did they get their needs met? And, um, you know, so it's, it's very true. It's gotta be a positive thing. If there's this negative toxic atmosphere, in the end, those things aren't gonna last. They, yeah. they never will. Music <laughs> is such a you know yin yang type thing. Yeah, you meet some of the most in the music business. You're going to meet some of the most beautiful human beings you've ever met in your life. You know, uh, and at the same time, I don't really feel like there's there's a gray area. You're going to meet. There's going to be a lot of a lot of negativity out there as well. Um, but uh, again, my you know. Once you have the the more negative experiences you have, you just you just put you just put blinders on. You don't even see them anymore. So you know, and and that's the thing. Like if you want to, if you want to do something creative, you really have to just you know, you're going to take so much negativity to, and it's going to get to that point where it's not going to bother. It doesn't it doesn't it doesn't bother you anymore. It's just it's it's just like watching like passing through something on the news. Like I'm not even going to worry about it because. Certainly, you know, we've had, we've had some phone discussions um, and like, uh, yeah, there is a very toxic atmosphere out there, even in jazz. Some of these uh, musicians, they talk trash about each other. They talk trash about people behind their backs. They've got an ego. They've got just a nasty attitude or they, they pull little moves behind behind people's backs that you wouldn't even expect that they would do. But that's, um, that's just the nature of the game. And it happens in every aspect of life, not just jazz. It happens in politics. It happens in, happens in religion. It happens in schools. It happens in academia. It just happens. And uh, you just have to learn 
these negative things, let them bounce off you, keep doing your thing. So, you know, Abe, thanks, thanks so much for doing this interview with us. Uh, you know, keep doing what you're doing in these times, these challenging coronavirus times. Uh, people can check you out. Uh, what's your social media links for people to check you out? So, uh, you know, for the, uh, the, you can get links on my website, abovadia.com. Um, but uh, as far as, uh, you know, Instagram, at abovadia, twitter.com slash abovadia, facebook.com slash abovadia. So uh, that's where you can, um, can uh, you know, check it out. Abe, hey, thanks for being a part, man. Thanks for being a part of the series. Hope to play with you again soon. You know, oh, I know. That, that will that be recognized once this, once this pandemic is over, you know. Thank you.